All right, this is a shout out, a thank you to Professor Naomi Oreskes. And I just listened to a video, a lecture she did in um, 2016 um, on, um, on, on global warming denialism and actually the some institute of advanced study not at princeton it was somewhere else i think it was in austria or something they they just uploaded a talk by her um they uploaded it this past month in july so um that talk was a more general overview of her work on the philosophy of science and his and their the history of science and i first read i read her i think it was her first book it was on the scientific debate about um, plate tectonics and what was then called continental drift. And I read the book around 2004, I want to say 2005. And um, I did a review of it on my first blog, which was the Guerrilla News Network. I had a blog there as part of my um, posting on the news network. It was just a forum that was started early on, and it was supposed to be like activist news. And um, I thought the book was really well written, but the science, you know, there was a lot of detail on the science. And so this recent talk that she gave, she basically, she just summarizes her book that she wrote back then. And the slides that she gives, the summary, it's, it uh, clar clarified the book for me a lot because I either I didn't remember what I had read back then. All I remembered was that the the U.S. scientists were relying on deduction, whereas the um, the English or British scientists were relying on the empirical evidence, and of course the British scientists were ar arguing that. Um, continental drift is real and therefore the you know the continents are moving and there's the subduction of the plates the continental plates and or the plate tectonics and um so in her recent talk she explains why the u.s scientists would not believe the British scientists and the evidence. And I didn't, I didn't remember this, or maybe I didn't pick it up in the, when I read the book, but obviously it's a key point in the book is that um, there were two models at the time about, about mountains and why they don't have any sort of gravitational anomaly or mag magnetic. Yeah. The, they don't change the magnetic um, pole um, reading. They don't. There's not any kind of gravitational change either, and they don't. There's. They were trying to understand well, why don't mountains just sink into the earth? Because you know how do they support all the the massive weight and. There was two different explanations, and one of them argued that the density of the the rock 
changed as the mountain got taller. There was less dense rock. And the other one argued that um, the, the, the depth of the rock underneath the earth was what was changing. And the first explanation enabled the underground depth just be equidistant and therefore the mathematics was a lot easier. And so she did all the research proving that the reason the US scientists rejected continental drift is because if you have the movement of the plate tectonics, then you couldn't have this equidistance assumption of the earth underneath the crust, you know, from the mountains. And it's just like really bizarre when you think about it. But the scientists, they literally, they admitted, well, the mathematics is just so much easier and you can't, you can't calculate the math for the other um, model of, and so it's a matter of, you know, the deduction part is the mathematics, because when you have the mathematical model, then you can do deductive analysis. But since the both the models, they worked in terms of the immediate issue of the gravitational anomaly of or why the mountains don't have any gravitational anomaly um but they did but obviously the first model doesn't work in terms of enabling or allowing plate tectonics to exist and that that debate took decades to resolve in science and so when I read that book, I posted a, a review of it on my blog, and I basically, I was comparing it to um, global warming. And I don't know, I don't, I'm assuming I looked up Naomi Oreskes, O-R-E-S-K-E-S, -E not sure how to pronounce her name, but um, I'm not sure why I connected it. You know, but it, it has to do with the scientific debate. But I didn't realize at the time she had published a paper in 2004 about, um, yeah, it was on global warming. And, and she had done a study. She, you know, her, her claim was, well, the, you know, the science is already totally resolved and in the models, um, you know, they work good enough. And her point was like, like in the past, like you can have the Ptolemaic astronomy model of epicycles. And even though it's a totally inaccurate model, it, it actually matches the the evidence so it worked while it was relied on you know and but the but in terms of global warming the model is actually you know it's accurate even though there's some fine tuning that they don't know about but um so she was you know she in in her talk in her paper in 2004 she had done a just an overview of the scientific database from ISI, which I used to use ISI, you know, when I was at the university, the citation, scientific citation database. And she said, well, that's before we had Google Scholar, you know, and, um, And she just searched, searched the scientific database for um, climate change um, dynamics or something like that. It was three words, climate change something. And she found just about a thousand papers, like 987 papers or something. 
and she then she went through every abstract and then she she categorized what the paper was about and she found that none of them actually um challenged the accepted truth of that global warming is real and that it's mainly caused by humans. And so that's what she pointed out in her talk. And then the everybody in the room just, apparently it was like this huge explosion of controversy. Like how dare she claim that global warming is accepted science. Um, and then she said she started receiving lots of hate mail after that and like personal attacks and everything. And that it was really traumatizing for her on a personal level. So I, I just remember when I read her first book on plate tectonics, I thought, well, this is a really good book and it's fascinating. And I, I I was just wondering what she was up to, and I had no idea at that time. When I I published it on my blog, I think it was around 2006, and she, I remember wondering, like, well, what is she up to now? And I didn't realize that she was, like, basically in hiding, you know? And then what she did was she started... Um, she started collaborating with other scientists who had experienced similar kind of attacks. And they all realized that the attacks were coming from the same place, which was this these um, policy think tanks that were funded by, you know, the oil industry and the big, big corporate um, corporations that hire these public public relation think tanks whether it's the Cato Institute or the I think it was the Marshall Institute or they have all these they try to sound fancy with their names you know the prestigious and such, such. Um, and that's that became our book Merchants of Doubt which became a bestseller book and was made into a documentary. And she's written like two other books since then, and now she's a Harvard professor. So she she made a big comeback, and it took her a long time. So she's really a, like a heroine because she, not only did she make a comeback, but she, <clears throat> by her... Um, collaboration with other scientists about um, acid rain and the, the ozone hole and tobacco science, then they were able to <clears throat> document this common source of the attacks on her and contextualize it. And this is something I can relate to personally since I worked in environmental policy and most of the work I did was as a volunteer because there's really no money in that work. And not only is there no money, but um, you undergo these same kind of attacks that she's talking about. So I had, I already had experience for that because I worked for, you know, Greenpeace, I worked, when I worked for Greenpeace, you know, I was literally going just door to door asking for donations, but we also did, um, we did protests, and our office got shut down by Germany, Germany shut down all the U.S. offices, because they said, well, you should just be volunteers, you know, but I started out working for Citizens for a Better Environment. That was in 1989. I did that full-time, you know, door-to-door -door donation, begging. <laughs> and 
working on policy issues and then I worked for Clean Water Action for 10 years and I also worked for the UW Greens and that was a lot more policy work because we had funding from the uh, students but then that got taken away because they didn't like all the policy work we were doing. And it turns out we had a huge FBI file, um, which I never saw, but it, it was pretty much all redacted anyway. And then I worked for the Resource Center of the Americas, which was human rights and environmental justice. And I actually worked as a dishwasher as for their fundraiser for the restaurant and the university shut us down because we had such a successful fundraising operation. We had huge lines of professors and students going for their lunch. And we just cooked um, rice and beans like with some pico de gallo. <clears throat> it was a very simple lunch, but it was fresh, fresh food. Uh, cooked every day and um, people wanted to support the cause you know so the university actually bought our building to shut down the restaurant you know and because they had a corporate food contract for you know that they, they didn't want any competition for their corporate contract um, let's see yeah, I got arrested eight, eight times doing protesting um, and writing policy papers and then organizing campaigns and coalitions. And I was actually kind of famous for a while in the Twin Cities, you know, at the university, especially doing activism at the university. Even the president of the university emailed me once to beg for me not to go on unlimited hunger strike, which I planned to do because I knew how to do that from my uh, Qigong training, my meditation training. And that was for the Workers' Rights Consortium for a sweatshop uh, workers' rights to increase the to improve the working conditions for all the sports apparel that the university was profiting from. So I'd, I had a lot of experience where I had to debate the student senate and the faculty, the public relations. The university had a whole public relations department and I had to debate them for a year in a uh, nine meetings with the um, general counsel who ran the university. And they, they also deleted my whole email account. And then they fired the treasurer after she helped me out. And she filed a lawsuit and the judge threw it out. That's after we got um, the total oil divestment of a uh, $1.5 million of total oil stock. They the university divested it because the total oil was using slave labor in Burma. And the treasurer was a African American lady. And she said, I'm going to go after tobacco stocks next. And, you know, that's what she told me when I thanked her after she, she got the regents to pass it through, you know? And so then they went, the, the administration, they went through her email and her, files and their voicemail and all that. They fired her. Anyway, so I can relate to Naomi Oreskes, her her work and what she's a rare um crossroads of science meeting corporate junk policy propaganda. And it's just it's just mind blowing how everybody has been indoctrinated because as Naomi points out, you know, energy runs, you know, it runs everything, you know, literally everything. So when you're talking about abrupt global warming, 
than everybody who is bought into civilization. I mean, everybody loves to use technology and the gadgets and all, you know, cell phones, obviously. And so everybody has a personal bias to not believe, to be in denial about abrupt uh, global warming, even though the science was well documented and detailed since the 1890s from uh, Savante Arrhenius. And um, it started in the 1820s, you know, when Fourier was realized that the atmosphere was trapping the earth from the heat from the sun. And as infrared radiation. And then it was like a couple decades later that um, I can always forget the guy's name. But that's when he realized it was uh, CO2 in the 1860s, maybe. And then um, Savante Arrhenius was the 1890s, you know, where he really documented the details about the actual warming levels. And, and then the evidence just kept increasing after that, and the models got better and so the science is pretty basic, but you do have to understand quantum mechanics and the photoelectric effect. And it's, it's kind of shocking how people don't learn. They don't learn the photoelectric effect from quantum physics, even though they might go to college or whatever. And so they're very easily um, diluted by the the corporate propaganda and the, the Koch brothers, especially in Exxon and all the other big petroleum companies, they've spent, you know, billions of dollars on, on the propaganda. And, um, and now, it, of course, if you really look at the science now with the aerosol masking effect and the methane bomb in the Arctic is, um, Guy McPherson points out, you know, it's it's too little too late. I mean, if we had taken action in the 1970s with Carter, I mean, what happened was is there was a huge corporate backlash against Ralph Nader. Um, and, the, and as Naomi Oreskes points out, there was this the whole point of it was these these Cold War scientists from the military, and they were part of the SDI, the Star Wars Defense um, Initiative. But they were they were a continuation from the World War Two uh, Cold War military science, and um, essentially, you know, there was this this paranoia that we would have uh, communism if we have government regulations so we cannot have any kind of free market uh, failures the market failures I mean I even wrote a paper about this in uh, when I was an undergraduate my paper was called the, the incorrect supply and demand model and I wrote that for environmental economics and my uh, instructors they just had a huge hissy fit and they passed my like my instructor he told me to change my topic and then so I just I just doubled down on my argument got more evidence then he passed my paper around to his office uh, fellow instructors and they were all like postgraduate I don't know they were PhD students I guess and they all they circled the paper with um, for looking for grammatical stylistic what they thought were errors you know like a comma like a I should have used a comma instead of a hyphen or something you know big red big red circle and like they went through the whole paper just circling commas essentially and then the only comment on the paper was I still think economists are smarter than you think they are. And that was it, you know. 
And that was part of my new, the new environmental option in uh, international relations. That was my undergraduate degree was actually in, it was supposed to be sustainable development. And I finished that degree in 1994. And already, I mean, I realized that the the three main disciplines of sustainable development, biology, economics, and political science, and they were all um, lying about each other because it was my, my degree was supposed to integrate the three disciplines. So I was the only one who was going to each of the three different schools and then discovering how they were lying about each other. It was kind of funny. Um, Anyway, so the uh, the ecological crisis, of course, is much worse than than maybe even Naomi Oreskes is willing to admit or you know look into. But even the the you know just the work, the basic work that she did, um, caused this huge uproar against her so she's very courageous for succeeding despite all the attacks on her and so this is just a thank you to I'm glad I found out what what had happened to her you know when I was wondering way back in um 2006 okay thanks